answer. Tushar? Okay, so first, don't speak in Hindi. You have to speak in English. No, 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 no. I'm not talking about... Now we are talking about TAM versus AM. So, TAM versus AM is we are in the world of asset management. So, we are no longer in the world of uh, corporate uh, treasury risk management. That is the hedging context. Okay. Here too, you might do some hedging, but that's... Uh, uh, that's not the primary focus of uh, this kind of uh, work. So we are not, I'm not asking you about, um, I'm talking about active versus, you can see one of the differences that we are going to discuss, we already discussed the difference between active and passive asset management in the last class of the previous course. And one of the points of distinction between TAM and AM is that the distinction between active and passive asset management, okay. So you can actually call this PAM and AM another time of, uh, but let's call it active versus because we are already using AM for alternative asset management. So active versus passive. Okay, maybe I should put a bracket here, which is, you won't get attendance. It's your choice. Go to the ca cafeteria, has good coffee. Okay, uh, active versus passive. What I should do is, um, I should put a bracket here. Okay. It should be first bracket, but I prefer using the third bracket. So this is what I mean by the question. Okay, this we already discussed in the last class. I'm just uh, doing a recap. So what is uh, one of the points that you, one of the ways that we are going to discuss uh, one of the way, ways we are going to dis distinguish between active and passive uh, asset management. Okay, uh, is that uh, sorry, uh, one of the ways we are going to dis distinguish between TAM and AM, the ninth point of distinction is that the distinction between active and passive management is a relevant distinction in, in the world of TAM. But in the world of AM, it's not a relevant distinction. Okay, are you following? Okay, let me explain. Maybe it's a little bit complicated. Let's before we come to this point. So the point what I'm saying, why is it a relevant distinction? Because in, in, in TAM, some of the act managers are passive managers and some of the managers are active managers. So therefore, it is relevant to distinguish when you're looking at a particular asset manager like Vanguard. You guys have heard of Jack Bogle who died recently. You guys are not following financial news at all. Okay, I think in the last about 15, 20 days, Jack Bogle has uh, passed away. The very old, uh, he was about 90 in the early 90s. So Jack Bogle is the founder of Vanguard. And Vanguard is one of the pioneers of index investing, which is essentially passive, act, passive asset management. Index investing is a form of passive asset management. All this has already been covered in the previous class. Okay, so uh, Jack Bogle, you should know all this. It just shows me that you guys are not tracking financial news uh, in the way that you've been instructed to, because it's been there all over the financial industry, uh, financial uh, you know media, and you see tributes to Jack Bogle. Maybe just go and do a coup, uh, because if you learn about what what the contributions of Jack Bogle to the uh, to to, to financial services. You'll learn a lot about the growth of index investing. So that's another way of learning about it. So you should go and Google about Jack Bogle later on. Okay. So Jack Bogle is the founder of Vanguard. Vanguard is one of the pioneers of passive investing, which means you don't bother with all these kinds of high flying grow portfolio managers. You just uh, try to mimic the index, try to invest in the broad index. Okay. Like the S&P 500. Okay. Or the NASDAQ composite. Okay. So that the, the idea being that the idea there is that the, the ability to outperform the index is quite limited. You must have heard about this when you were uh, when you encountered mutual fund uh, discussions. Have you come across this idea that most mutual fund managers, okay, all these high flying portfolio managers who are managing their mutual funds, most of them do not manage to beat the index. Have you guys heard about this expression? Have you guys heard come across this idea? Yes. Some of you might have come across this idea, right? So this is quite uh, well documented that most active managers, these are active managers. Again, you have to go back to the discussion of active and passive, which we had in the previous class. So we'll do that again. Uh, but most active managers do not manage to beat the index. Okay, it's a pretty high percentage, I think 85 to 90% of the managers. So therefore, the theory was that why should we and remember, we discussed in the previous class, I think Sena answered that question, which is that uh, in what type of what type of manager charges a higher fee? Active manager or passive manager? Passive. Active managers charge higher fees. When you look at mutual funds, you have this concept of, remember this concept of expense ratio? This again was mentioned by Sina in the last class. 
okay this is the advantage of video i can go back and see <laughs> it's easier to see what is being who is saying what etc okay so uh, now uh, uh, expense ratio is what you see you guys should be familiar with all this okay so expense ratio when you discuss when you do go and do any kind of research on mutual funds okay some of you might be doing your capstone projects on mutual funds and things like that so if you do any kind of research on mutual funds you'll see that there's one way to rank the mutual funds is through expense ratios expense ratio is nothing but whatever you have invested in the fund if you invested a hundred dollars in the fund and the fund has an expense ratio of uh, you know one dollar one percent that means one percent of the assets under management out of your one dollar that means the guy is actually going to manage only 99 cents for you okay so what did i say hundred dollars okay so 99 dollars he's going to manage only 99 dollars for you and that one dollar goes straight into his pocket that's his management fee Okay, that's what the expense ratio means. That if you have a 1% expense ratio, you invest $100, the fund manager is only managing $99 of your assets. The one, $1 goes straight into his pocket as a fee. You're never going to see that again. Whether he makes money or loses money for you, you're never going to see that again. Okay, is that clear? So that's what the expense ratio means. So if you look at the expense ratios of mutual funds, you will see that active mutual funds, actively managed. These are called actively managed and the others are passive okay so the actively managed mutual funds will have higher expense ratios than the passive mutual funds okay or passively managed mutual funds so this is one point that you see the reasoning for that was also given uh, in the last class when we discussed this which is that because why why do active managers have higher fees you forgotten the distinction between active and passive Anyone? The risk associated in the active, uh, active uh, asset management is much more higher than the passive. Because okay, it's not much more higher, it's much higher. Okay, uh, but no, it's not, that's not strictly correct. It could be because you could have a higher chance of tracking error. In a sense, you're correct. But the main reason they, that's not, this is the answer that, one of the answers that came in the previous session as well. But the main reason that they have higher fees is that they are actually doing something, you know, it's just like you go to a standard, if you go to a McDonald's, Okay, if you go to a McDonald's, uh, it's yeah. cheaper than if you go to a, you've heard of Michelin? You've heard of Michelin stars? Yes. Okay, so these restaurants are all, the top chefs are all given Michelin stars, right? So these, uh, you have these high tech, uh, very high fi restaurants. They are, uh, some of them have Michelin stars. Okay, so these, this is actually an index, okay, a way of ranking the chefs and the restaurants. So if you go to a, like a four star Michelin uh, chef's restaurant, Obviously, the fee, the same amount of food that you eat or the same dish that you eat in McDonald's, if, if that guy, the four-star chef makes you a burger, it'll cost a lot more, okay? So essentially, what it's, it's a similar idea here. In active managers, what they're saying is that we are so good that we are going to outperform the index, which is the benchmark, okay? So the index is really, we keep saying outperform the index, but what we really mean in general terms is we are going to outperform the benchmark. Remember, when we had the discussion about, um, looks like most people have not wake, woken up today. Everybody looks kind of uh, doped out. Yes. Asset, asset management, the benchmark, according to me. Sorry, in? In active uh, asset management, and uh, the index should not be the benchmark. For the, for the fund manager. Yeah, I think you have a good point. What he's saying is that in active asset management, uh, the index should not be the benchmark. Okay. The, uh, the reason I'm saying that's a good point is actually if you see active management, one of the other things that we are going to say is that uh, this is a, one of the biggest uh, fund managers. You should also be aware of this company. This is actually probably the largest money manager in the world, BlackRock. Okay, they have I think something like six trillion dollars. Okay, Archal is going to lose some points. I don't know what is happening. She's giggling for some reason. Who is sitting next to Tushar? No one. No one. Okay, so Archal, you come and sit next to Tushar. We need to separate you from Sahil. Okay, so and then we have to deduct two two marks for your team. Okay, so what are we talking about? So the point that uh, Goel has made is a good, very good point. He's saying that an active manager should not be evaluated against a passive index. Okay. Uh, against an index okay what is, he's saying that's a good point because one of the things let me just take care of this uh, little uh, at punishment routine okay maybe I should increase the points now minus two is not really hurting you guys so I should maybe make it minus four 
something. How did this? Oh, I've opened the IFM CP sheet. This is the wrong sheet. I was because I, I, I zeroed out all the marks from the previous sheet. Um, no, no, again, I'm going into. Um, I need to go into FDR and CP. I've, I've clicked on that now. There will be a problem. Okay, and please remember, guys, if you don't get the sharing mail in the by this evening, please uh, by not even this evening. I should do it. If you don't get it by lunchtime, please send me an email. Okay, as soon as I go back from the class, I'm going to share all you guys into this uh, uh, folder. So. Okay, so Achal is opening the account. Okay, so let me say. right. So if you see here, now let's go back to this point. So we are anticipating point number nine. Distinction number nine is that the distinction between active and passive. We are in the world of asset management. Okay, we are no longer in the corporate treasury risk management hedging uh, world. We can do some hedging here as well, but mainly we are in the world of asset management. So I'm not going to repeat asset management every time. But the distinction between active under the un, in the TAM universe. The distinction between active and passive is a relevant distinction because some of the managers are passive managers and some are active managers like Vanguard okay is mainly known as a passive manager all they have are index funds okay they're a very big manager they have lots of I don't remember the AUM for Vanguard but it's very very big it's like Fidelity it's one of the largest uh, fund managers uh, in the TAM universe okay so um, now you have uh, so so what we are saying is active versus passive the distinction is relevant because some managers are active and some are passive okay but what we are saying in in the case of am if you see okay in the case of am we are saying that the distinction you can't read this at this point let me just uh, we are saying in the case of am we are saying the distinction is not relevant because in AM, everybody is an active manager. There is no concept of passive management in AM. Okay, so uh, therefore, an AM, as you guys will, should be aware, AM uh, loosely people use the word hedge funds to refer to AM. Okay, so but that's not a very good way to refer to it. But it's a short form, so people just use it uh, instead of saying alternative asset management all the time. So hedge funds is loosely used to refer to um, uh, alternative asset management. Okay, or alternative asset managers. So here we are saying the distinction is not relevant because everybody in active is an active manager. So why is Goel's observation a very good observation? Because remember, when he when we went when we discussed benchmarking, when we discussed the differences in benchmarking, in the case of uh, TAM, in the case of TAM, the benchmark was typically the index. Okay, which is uh, I mean some kind of broad equity index. Okay, or equity or bond index, you can have bond managers as well. Okay, so it is some kind of index, which is like, let's take the example of equities, which is a very easy example. So if you look at, um, if you look at BlackRock, okay, oh, why is this big ad coming? Anyway, so let's set up a, a comparison here. compare okay so let's take blackrock and let's manage it let's just check them against the s p 500 and see how they've done okay all right okay so you can see it's difficult for you guys to make out the difference in the colors uh, but i can tell you that uh, blackrock is uh, the s p 500 index is in orange and the blackrock is in red okay so blackrock over the period that we are looking at this is this is what we call our investment horizon okay or our performance evaluation horizon 2014 approximately till now okay and uh, the index is down 56 percent and blackrock is down 49 percent okay so blackrock is going to say i'm a star because i have outperformed the index if you remember that we discussed this point because they are always evaluated in tam uh, they are evaluated against an index and actually even active managers in tam are evaluated against an index okay but this is the po good point that Goyal has made that they should not be because if they to the extent that they are an active manager okay that means they're tr tr uh, leading more towards am do you realize that because we said in am everybody is an active manager so do you realize that to the extent the uh, 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 tam portfolio manager like a typical equity or bond portfolio manager 
to the extent that they are uh, lean, uh, do, they are doing active management. They are leaning more towards AM because AM managers are active uh, or are, are all active managers. Do you realize this point, Aryan? You are not clear. See, we are saying that all AM, all uh, let's just lose hedge funds also. I mean, let's let's stick to AM. So all AM managers are active managers. We said that. So some of the TAM managers are active and some are passive. So what we are saying is that to, to some extent, uh, to the extent that a TAM manager, okay, that is a traditional manager, okay, a mutual fund is practicing active management. Is it not more and more like an AM manager because all AM managers are active, okay, in that sense, okay. So in that sense, and remember that when you go to AM, remember for the, uh, the uh, in the case of AM, we are using absolute uh, benchmarks. We are just, you remember we had discussed the case of, uh, what was the what is the investment firm of Howard Marks called? All these discussions which we are having in the classes, I don't know, you guys are not registering, even the exams, Oak Tree, correct? So these are all very big investment managers. You guys should be aware of this part of your as finance students, when you go out into the world, you should, and asset management is a very big sector of uh, within financial services. So you should be aware this is part, this is expected of uh, finance students. If you haven't heard of the big players, it's like the guy who says, I'm interested in technology and you ask him, oh, what is Oracle? You know, they doesn't know, he's not heard of Oracle. He hasn't heard of Apple. He hasn't heard of, uh, you know, salesforce.com. So it doesn't make, it's not impressive. So you need to pass part of your knowledge. This is your contextual knowledge. You should know who the big players are in, in the different subsectors of financial services. Okay. Right. So Oak Tree is a very big distressed debt manager. All right. So uh, remember, we discussed that Oak Tree works on an 8% hurdle rate. So whatever they make currently, their hurdle rate is around 8%. So if they make 38%, okay, they are going to get paid a certain percentage of that 30%. The benchmark is 8%. Okay, so they promised the investor that we, we are going to make it, if we don't make more than 8%, we are not going to take any money. Okay, they may have some management fee part, we will come to that. Okay, uh, so usually this, um, I don't know, we've discussed that, we'll just mention it. Okay, typically, um, we should just mention it here. Okay, so uh, essentially, let's assume that here there is no management fee. In the case of, case of Oak Tree, they don't, what they're telling the investor is that if we don't make at least 8% return for you, we are not taking any money. Okay. Unlike a mutual fund, which is going to charge you that expense ratio anyway, whether they make money for you or lose money for you, the mutual fund is going to take that expense ratio anyway. Okay. So some of the asset managers, some of the AM managers will have only what is called an incentive fee. Okay. And so we can just write it here. Um, this is not really connected. Uh, we can have this here. Okay then we just say that the fees are um okay yeah i have it here i've already written it here because this was prepared earlier okay um you can see the plus sign okay so typically how the am manager gets compensated is you have two components to the compensation you have a percentage of assets managed and an incentive fee okay commonly you will hear this expression called two i mean there's an expression which is here which is very often uh, used in the case of I can't even see what I'm writing here. My screen is dirty. Um, 2 and 20. Okay. So you'll hear this expression. Have you heard this expression before, guys? 2 and 20. Okay. What the, what does this mean? 2 and 20 means? Um, let's copy from here. So we are drifting around a little bit. But, I mean, we are looping inside the discussion. Uh, because I was trying to explain um, this. And... Um, so 2 and 20 means everyone understands the sign implies okay 2 and 20 means 2% of assets managed assets managed you understand if I've given you 10 million dollars to manage for me that means I'll have to pay you 2% every year of the 10 million dollars that's just a management fee okay then there's the incentive fee okay which is um, um let's write it slightly differently two percent um uh, twenty percent of profits is the incentive fee 
All right. Okay. So two and twenty in the hedge fund world. Okay, is it means essentially this is a standard that a lot of hedge fund managers use typically because every industry develops some kind of standard right like in the uh, in the real estate business if you're taking a house on rent typically you have to pay one or two months rent as brokerage okay so that's these kind of standards evolve in every industry so um, here what they've evolved is a standard which many people use which is 2 and 20 which is 2% of assets managed and 20% of profits okay but there are many financial managers who also try to distinguish with themselves by deviating from this norm and they say like some managers like Tudor investments have you heard of Tudor so Tudor investments started by Paul Tudor Jones he's one of the legendary traders uh, so Tudor investments has uh, used to have at least I don't know whether they still have it but most for most of his career he never charged any management fee so his management fee was zero so he would only make certain percentage of profits like so 30% or 25% of profits or something like that. Okay, so this is sometimes you can vary this but 2 and 20 is that if you hear this expression 2 and 20 what it means is it's referring to the standard practice in the AM universe for managers to charge 2% of the assets managed and 20% of profits. Is this clear? So whatever profit I make profits means okay you have to be aware that profits aware away ahead of profits above a this also you should be aware when you're looking at this entire discussion is on let me write it like this in fact you're not sure not supposed to not supposed to write it like this but let's call it a high water mark okay okay so Pro profits above a high water mark will explain what this high water mark is but the general idea is 2 and 20 means I make 2% of assets managed okay and I also make 20% of profits okay and then you can vary this so some people as I told you oak tree I don't know if they have a manage a management fee but they do have this uh, incentive fee that they use a hurdle so if they don't make it more than 8% they don't take any money so if they make 38% then they will take a certain portion of that 30% return Okay, so that 30% return that they have made, they will take a certain portion, maybe 25-30% of that 30% excess return. Is this clear to everybody? You understood now? What is the thing? Okay, so what we are saying is say by and large, this is a very good example of a typical, of what is a classical um, uh, classical benchmark in, uh, in the AM universe, what Oak Tree uses. That 8% hurdle rate that Oak Tree uses is a very good example of the classical benchmark in the AM universe okay which means they they set a particular hurdle rate okay now it is eight percent later on it could change uh, and obviously it's related to the risk-free rate uh, so uh, they set this benchmark and anything above the benchmark they get credit for and they get paid for okay so this is an absolute return strategy can you see that okay it is of course you are comparing it to the benchmark but you set an absolute benchmark you don't set uh, an index as a benchmark because the index you can see here in this particular example the index is down 49% uh, okay sorry the index is down 57% roughly okay but this index can never be uh, so this is the benchmark see here you have a situation where the index is the benchmark the S&P 500 and the benchmark is down 57% this is the difference between absolute and relative performance measurement okay in a relative performance measurement situation in the TAM universe your index can also be down if the stock market is suffering okay then the index as you can see here that the stock market has uh, got this ne negative performance i don't know why this negative is coming here because um, i don't know where the, how they're calculating it because overall the graph shows that it's up i don't know anyway we won't worry about it we'll just see these numbers but the point is that you can have uh, we can just make this a little bit different we can change the okay now we can see okay see the still the this why is this ad coming anyway so uh, the point is that in a in a TAM, in the TAM universe when you're using a benchmark uh, you're using an index as a benchmark like the S&P 500 uh, nifty 50 okay or BSE 200 if you're using any of these any of these indices could be down for any period you understand that just like the S&P 500 is down for this particular period you can see okay so therefore you, you can have this situation where uh, in, in the TAM universe where the benchmark itself is down okay but in the am universe can you see this hurdle rate for instance example let's say eight percent
of PCA oak tree has a 8% hurdle rate. So can this hurdle rate ever be negative? We have already set it at 8%. Okay, so it's fixed. So in this sense, we say that this is an absolute return kind of universe. Okay, here we are not comparing against a particular benchmark which can go up and down. So here in this sense, we say this is an absolute return universe because you're comparing against and you're really trying to make as much as you can. Okay, uh, as much as you can uh, and therefore you'll get paid on the excess return that you make. Is this clear? Okay, all right. Yes, Ria, you have a question? Okay, all right. Okay, uh, so the point I was trying to make is that so it's a long answer to uh, a long discussion on uh, Goyle's observation, but it's a very good observation that to the extent that a TAM manager is an active manager, he's behaving more and more like a AM manager because in the AM universe, everybody is an active manager. And in the AM universe, we don't evaluate people against particular benchmarks, which can go up and down. We evaluate them against absolute numbers. Okay. So if you made 35%, you're better than somebody who made 25% okay in that sense okay so that's what we look at we don't look at some kind of benchmark which can change uh, in value all right okay so coming back to the distinction between active and passive we are a little bit we are floating around a little bit but we have to actually this has already been discussed uh, yes okay so this has already been discussed in the last class remember we all started this whole thing as a, as a recap so it's 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 uh, unfortunate that no, nobody seems to remember this very well so the point is that active versus passive. So now this much you understand why the distinction is relevant in TAM and it's not relevant in AM because everybody is an active manager. Okay. So now quickly to recap the difference between active and passive. Okay. You can actually go and I'm not going to spend time re uh, recapping, in, uh, recapping in detail because it's there in the previous video. Okay. In the last video of the previous uh, course. Uh, so just check that. So in passive. Okay. What you would do is that remember it, it, this is uh, this is a TAM universe. So active versus passive distinction occurs only in the TAM. The question arises only in the TAM universe. Okay, so these are mutual funds, equity or bond mutual funds. Let's say that BlackRock itself is a mutual fund. Okay, so and BlackRock knows that it's going to be evaluated against the S&P 500. Okay, so one of the things that BlackRock, one of the safest things that BlackRock can do is it can just buy instead of buying all kinds of using its brain and trying to do all kinds of fancy things it can just buy all the stocks in the s p 500 in the proportions that are that they are present in the index is this clear you understand what an index is it's just an average okay in this case it's a cap weight to capitalization you understand ma market cap everybody understands market cap okay so it's a market the s p 500 is a market cap weighted average one very famous uh, stock index uh, stock index which is a unweighted average is the nikkei 225 okay it's the most prominent uh, index in japan but the nikkei 225 is an example of an unweighted average okay so they just take the 225 uh, companies and they just uh, they don't use any weighted weighting in, uh, or by market cap or they just take a simple average okay but things like the nifty 50 and the uh, s p 500 these are all cap weighted averages which means they have to weight it by the market cap so if some stock has a higher market cap that his uh, that stock price will have a higher component in the overall has a higher role in the uh, in the overall value of the index so so one of the things a passive a passive what uh, a manager can do is if he's in the tam universe if he knows he's going to be evaluated against a because both active and passive managers are going to be evaluated against a benchmark which is the stock index a broad stock index okay like nasdaq the nasdaq composite s p 500 so one of the things he can do is if his benchmark is the s p 500 he can just mimic the s p 500 you understand what mimicking is okay whatever one guy does the other guy re replicates it so you can just what you can do is you know everyone knows the composition of the s p 500 okay so you can just buy the stocks in those particular stocks in that proportion in your portfolio yes. so and that's a safe strategy because there you can never have any kind of negative uh, you can't have any tracking negative tracking error you remember tracking error all these were things were discussed in the previous code now you've all forgotten this is not acceptable for finance students because if you learn these concepts they should be with you for life okay so tracking error is the extent to which you underperform your benchmark all right so some people say positive tracking error if you're outperforming but i don't think that's a good way to use the word uh, so error is only on the negative side. Okay, so tra tracking errors the extent to which you minimize uh, underperform the index So if you just mimic the index, then you can't underperform the index Okay, and but then you can't outperform either 
okay you're stuck you're just replicating the index so this expression again we described discussed in, this is called closet indexing you remember this expression closet indexing this is called closet indexing so an active manager what he does <clears throat> so an active manager essentially does not do closet indexing he makes active stock selection so he looks at the benchmark composition on one side okay so he may have a chart on his wall saying okay this is the uh, distribution of stocks in the s p 500 in the following percentages this is what the index is this is my benchmark but i can i think i can do much better than this that suppose that apple has so one of the things he can do is if the benchmark has certain stocks one two three four two five uh two let's say 500 okay those lets you serially number the stocks in the s p 500 the benchmark has one to 500 stocks so he can select some other stocks stock number 603 stock number 750 so he can select he can build a portfolio of stocks which none of which are there in the index okay because he thinks that all of those other stocks are going to do much better than the stocks in the index that's one way he can uh, outperform uh, or be different from the index okay he can choose a completely different set of stocks okay and the other way he can do it is he can change the weights mm -hmm. so let's say apple has a two percent weighting in the uh, s p 500 let's say just as an example okay uh but this fund manager if he wants to be an active manager one of the other ways in which he, he can be an active manager is even without changing any of the stocks in the index he can have the same stocks as they as uh, as are present in the index okay or bulk of the same stocks but he can radically change the weights so let's say at apple has a two percent weighting in the s&p 500 but this guy the fund manager who if he thinks that apple is going to do much much better than the other stocks in the s&p 500 he can make apple 45 percent of his portfolio he can invest 45 percent of his portfolio in apple now already he has become an active manager even though he's not actually changing the stocks that are there in the S&P 500, he keeps the same stocks, but he plays around with the uh, proportions. Okay, Apple is 2% of the S&P 500, let's say, but this guy makes Apple for 45% of his portfolio. Okay, because he thinks Apple is going to do much, much better. Is this clear? Yes. So these are all the ways in which you can be an active manager. And a passive manager is evaluated against uh, indices like this, like the S&P 500. Uh, active manager what he do, does is he basically says that I don't have to blindly mimic the index I'm going to be different either I'll choose different stocks or I'll change the weighting of stocks in the index is this clear all right so this is the difference in active and passive so now as we said so we've covered one more point um, that now we've essentially covered nine uh, point number nine as well okay that in active uh, in, in TAM there is a distinction between active and passive which is a relevant distinction because when you see a TAM manager, you one of the questions you have to ask is you have to find out whether this is an active manager or a passive manager. Like I told you the story of Vanguard. Vanguard is essentially a passive manager. Okay, where if you look at Fidelity, for instance, Fidelity is more known as an active manager. Okay, so one of the famous, have you guys heard of Peter Lynch? Peter Lynch wrote this book, which you guys, anybody who's interested in equity investing should read this book. It's called One Up on Wall Street. Okay, so Peter Lynch is one of the uh, well-known uh, uh, equity uh, fund man, mutual fund managers. So he managed the Fidelity Ma Magellan Fund. You know who Magellan is? Magellan is, I think, is a Portuguese. Uh, he's like Columbus and all Vasco da Gama, all these guys who used to go sailing around the world. So Mag Magellan is a famous explorer. So the Fidelity Magellan Fund was managed by Peter Lynch for, I think, almost 15 years or something. And he uh, significantly outperformed the S&P 500 index. Okay. So he's, he's known as one of the greats of equity mutual fund investing. All right. So uh, Fidelity, that's, uh, he was, and he was with Fidelity. So Fidelity is more known as an active uh, money manager. Okay. So the distinction between this, uh, these two is relevant in the TAM universe but it's not relevant in the AM universe because everybody is an active manager. Okay, now one of the things that you have to be aware of is, I'm going to put it here itself. Um, as, as students of finance in this day and age, you should be aware of this very important trend, okay, uh, which is, it's actually a very significant shift, but I'm just going to write it as a shift, okay. Shift from um shift of actually shift of it's not very well written but i'll explain to you what this means and you should understand this writing then uh aum from what is happening we are saying that in the context of the discussion between um 
active and passive there is some kind of shift happening in the AUM what kind of shift is happening do you guys can you guys guess have you heard of any of this this is another indication that you guys are not doing enough you're not surveying the industry you're not tracking the news properly if you were listening to Bloomberg TV regularly you would have heard these kind of discussions one of the trends that's going on in the industry for the last almost uh, a decade now okay uh, what is happening is what is happening there's a trend that lots of money is shifting from either from active to passive or passive to active so what is it what is it that's happening active to, active to passive okay so this is the correct answer so what are the trends that you have to be aware of because you're operating in the industry now you're going to be graduating now and as trends emerge you should be aware of them so one of the very big trends in the asset management industry globally is the shift from active to passive okay as um, more and more mutual fund more and more evidence emerges that active managers are not able to outperform the index so active managers are doing kind of like this okay like okay here they have outperformed the index because they're down four and a half and they're down six and a half the index is down six and a half but uh, if it were reversed okay most of the time you're finding that active managers are not able to outbeat the index that is the benchmark the equity index in this case is the benchmark okay so you're not able to beat the benchmark so and remember one thing that uh, active managers remember active man who charges higher fees active or passive <laughs> active okay so a you're charging me higher fees and b your performance is worse than the benchmark so why should i invest with you okay so this is one of the uh, sort of uh, you know elements of logic that is driving investors from and it's leading to a huge flight of capital from active to passive funds okay uh, so this is something that you have to be aware of and then sometimes you'll see ebbs and flows in this kind of thing when active managers outperform then uh, some money may flow back into active etc but there is an underlying trend uh, to move money from active to passive because passive management is much cheaper okay and it's you can mechanize it much more okay all this can we say that uh, the Use the mic since we are not. Uh, where's the mic? No, no, you, you, uh, you don't need it, but let's use it. Okay, give him the mic. It'll slow us down a little bit, but let's use it. Yes. So can we say that the global financial crises are also a reason for this? You could say that. You could say that. That's a good. That's also a very good point, actually. Uh, that uh, what Tushar is saying is that the global for this shift that I'm talking about, the shift of uh, capital from actively managed uh, funds to passively managed funds, whether it was also caused by the global financial crisis, and it's actually very true. Okay, you're very right there, actually. That uh, see what happened in the uh, as a as a reaction to the global financial crisis. Now, this is something else you guys should have read up on. Have you guys got your textbooks, this Halan Basu book? No. Not yet? Okay. So when you get the textbook, in case I forget to mention it once again, there's a very good chapter in the Halan Basu book on uh, the global financial crisis, okay, which is we normally refer to the 2008 crisis, okay, the September 2008 bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers. And then that's when things started to get really bad. Uh, so what happened as a result of that uh, GFC is that central banks worldwide I, I hope some of you guys are aware of this what was the what was the response of central banks did they cut interest rates or raise interest rates so they cut, cut interest rates okay now which countries now what what kind of interest rate does what are the ecb's policy rate right now zero it's not zero it's actually minus, minus. 40 basis points right so it's actually uh, sub zero actually minus 40 basis point the bank of japan also has negative uh, interest rates on some part of the reserves they're getting negative interest rates so these are two very prominent economic blocks japan and the eu which still have negative interest rates but you're right that uh, at the general monetary policy response to the gfc was aggressive cutting of rates very aggressive cutting of rates driving rates to near zero the federal reserve was the federal reserve is a central bank for which country US, US. us okay so the federal reserve came down to near zero they didn't go to negative but the eu went to negative ecb went to negative boj went to negative since so smaller countries like denmark norway they also went into negative okay so but they're much smaller countries but generally the idea was central banks were doing negative interest uh, they were engaging in negative interest rates uh, uh, basically uh, implementing negative interest rate policies or very low interest rate policies and then they came up when that was not sufficient to 
Uh, what is the problem, Sahil? We'll have to cut marks for Sahil. You may be from the same team. Are you from the same team? What is the problem? Let's remove him from the danger position. Let's put him somewhere else. Why don't you come and sit behind? Come and sit behind the Rizima. So you'll be aware away from your buddies. You'll be a little isolated. Okay. All right. Okay. So which team are you in? Same team. Great. You are really running away with the uh, trophy. Okay. Okay. So, Shreto, so there is a shift of AUM from active to passive. Okay. This is something you should be aware of as a major trend. All right. Okay. So, what was I saying? And so, it's a very good point that Tushar has brought out, which is that this shift was accentuated try to understand this. this is a slightly subtle point if you don't pay attention you will not understand it okay uh, what happened was so the central ranks in response to the gfc one what they did was they aggressively cut interest rates so every central bank around the world in india also the same thing happened they aggressively cut interest rates to maintain very low interest rates okay in addition to that some of the major central banks like the ecb and the federal reserve engaged in what is known as quantitative easing okay let me write this all here itself in the discussion now maybe we should write it in the notes um, yeah okay let's call it let's put it here okay so um, let's put it under this is a very important topic as well okay try to read up on this if you can I'm not going to write perfect English, so I'm not going to write the GFC. I'll just write GFC. Okay, monetary policy response to GFC. Um, zero. Okay. This is another acronym that you guys should be aware of as finance students. ZERP. ZERP means zero interest rate policy. Okay. Or NERP. What is NERP? No interest rate policy. Negative interest rate. <laughs> but no interest rate is better than negative interest rate. <laughs> negative interest rate policy. Okay. Okay. Then what happened was so obviously. Uh, if you cut interest rates, you would expect economic growth to be, uh, I mean, to, to respond positively or negatively? Positively. Positively, right? Because you're making, reducing the cost of borrowing. So making a lot of more projects are viable now. Okay. So negative interest rate, lowering interest rates normally would have a positive impact on growth. Because what happened as a result of the GFC was there was a massive sentiment shock to the market. Okay. There was a massive credit shock and lots of banks were pulling credit because they lost a lot of money in the in the uh, you know mortgage-backed securities, okay, which were uh, mainly mainly uh, involved in the in the financial crisis. So uh, therefore, they started because of the large losses that they suffered, they started pulling back on credit, okay. So uh, therefore, the government wanted to uh, encourage them to lend, and therefore they wanted to increase the demand for loans. And one of the things they did was cut interest rates, but even that did not work, okay. Even uh, as a response to lower interest rates, growth did not pick up. It took a long time, so they were uh, growth was not picking up. So as a result of that, in around I think 2013, 14, central banks started what is known as quantitative easing. Okay, so let's talk about this. Have you have you heard this term? QE. This is called QE. Have you heard this term? Okay, you should have heard this term by now. Okay, these are all important terms. That's why I keep telling you guys to watch Bloomberg TV all the time. At least one hour every day because you're going to hear a lot of terms that you don't know and then you can read up on them or you can ask me in the class that's how you increase your knowledge that's why i gave you this formula but your uh, program is almost over and none of you guys uh, have been following up on the recommendations okay so but lowering interest rate will increase inflation rate that's also a good point but that is a chance that they took they figured that in this environment, because remember the central banks of the power, the, you understand the point that Satyam has raised. That's also a very good point that lowering inflation rates, uh, lowering interest rates will risk in, uh, higher inflation. Okay. 
so essentially what they did was if you put this in a little bit of a block here we can just take this as um, so if you look at the central bank CB I'm running for central bank okay um, or let's say the central bank mandate the typical central bank mandate is uh, I'm giving a long answer to um, long response to Satyam typically it is um, promote economic growth so like what is the the US Federal Reserve you understand what the mandate is mandate means this is what you have to do this is your role okay when a central bank is set up this is your role the central bank is told by the government that this is your role okay it's usually controlled by the executive branch of the government you remember the three branches of government mm -hmm. e executive legislative and judicial okay so uh, the executive branch typically uh, nominates the head of the central bank as you can see here in India as well we had this recent change in the RBI governor so who which branch of government appointed the governor executive, executive branch because this the the government in power okay but so the act of RBI is formed by the legislative yeah the act of the RBI act is formed by the legislative uh, legislative branch but it gives a lot of power to the executive branch if you see the if you read the act through the act itself the executive branch of uh, government is uh, empowered to essentially manage RBI on a day-to-day -day basis okay but you're right that the la act is drafted by the and passed by the legislative branch okay so typically the central bank mandate once again a long response to Satyam's point okay his point was that cutting interest rates why did they cut interest rates because it might have increased inflation okay so typically their uh, mandate of a central bank you take the US Federal Reserve as an example okay most central banks have this kind of a dual mandate okay uh, typically a dual mandate these are all terms okay that you have to which is dual mandate is one is promote economic growth and two control inflation okay what kind of mandate does the Reserve Bank of India have is it dual okay so strictly speaking if you look at the Reserve Bank of India the RBI mandate it is not a dual mandate okay this was instituted by formalized by Raghuram Rajan when he was governor but now that is converted to dual mandate yeah so effectively what happens is because the executive branch of government which is the government in power okay because they want to promote growth and inflation is less of a concern okay they always want to promote growth because they have to worry about the next election and things like that so there's always you can see the same problem happening the same situation in the US and India mm -hmm. you know that Trump has been very critical about uh, the uh, Federal Reserve raising interest rates because the US Fed has been raising very aggressively and he's worried that this will uh, dampen economic growth okay increase the cost of borrowing and they, they have increased quite dramatically actually they're doing three things which uh, which is a more involved discussion they're actually cutting down their uh, bond purchases that is withdrawing qe they're removing something called forward guidance and becoming moving to data dependency and then they're also raising interest rates so these there's actually a three-pronged uh, rise in in uh, you know a tightening of financial conditions in the us so if you look at the performance of the us economy in the face of all this uh, headwind it's actually quite phenomenal you imagine what would have happened if they had not moved on interest rates the US economy has been very very strong and so and that's partly I think mainly driven by deregulation and tax cuts okay which uh, I wish our policymakers would take a leaf out of that we could also enjoy that kind of growth but anyway so and two is control inflation so what Satyam is asking is so this is a typical mandate but you should be aware that the Reserve Bank's formal mandate is only for controlling inflation okay four percent I think it's four percent plus minus two yes. right all right so that's a that's a unique kind of mandate because it's focused only on uh, inflation control okay similarly before the eurozone was formed the Deutsche Bundesbank which was the central bank for Germany okay they still are the central bank but the policy is run by the ECB uh, the Bundesbank was well known as a person as a central bank that focused very much on inflation control and they were not so worried about growth okay they were mainly focused on inflation control but the US Federal Reserve the most important central bank in the world has to worry about both uh, aspects all right so what Satyam is asking now why did they do that why did they cut in your right that if you cut interest rates 
it is mainly seen as a risk that I mean this creates a risk that there might be uh, very high inflation it might lead to high inflation but the reason they didn't worry about that side so obviously it's a it's a delicate balance if you have to promote growth and uh, control inflation in order to promote growth you need lower interest rates or it helps to have lower interest rates okay it's but trade it's a trade-off okay it's a trade-off so there is a trade-off involved here because in order to promote growth it helps to have lower interest rates okay now again Dina and Ria will have to lose marks Ria is also in your team Yes, sir. there's some discussion going on there if you don't want if you are not interested what's going on in the class then you can put your head down and sleep that is always you're always welcome to do that no no you are listening to Dina not to me <laughs> so you're looking at her and smiling and listening to me okay all right okay uh, where is the team Ridhima so you also opened your account all right okay so what discussion are we having so now the point is uh, so so what your theme is saying so as there is a trade off involved okay so if you raise interest rates you will be able to control inflation but if you cut interest rate but you might choke off economic growth because interest rates are too high but if you and if you try to promote economic growth by cutting interest rates you may risk uh, raising inflation okay so there is a delicate balance to be uh, you know maintained so essentially what they decided is they decided to lean in favor of simulating growth because at that point of time, if you looked at the market mood, Lehman Brothers had just declared bankruptcy, mm. which was a big surprise to the market. Okay, the market wasn't expecting it. And uh, there was a lot of other problems with other firms as well. Merrill Lynch had to be taken over. Okay, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, who were not really in any, any trouble, but they had to, there was so much a panic in the market that they had to go and register themselves as banking companies. Okay, they were standalone investment banks, but they had to go and register themselves as banking companies so that people would feel that they are banks now and they have the support of the Federal Reserve as an umbrella okay so that kind of confidence even firms like Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley which were really blue chip investment banks the market panic was so high that even those kind of firms had to go and seek the umbrella of the Federal Reserve and become banks so in that kind of environment the central banks believe that the much greater risk uh, the I mean uh, going into a deflation that is a period of a recession or depression that kind of situation uh, going into a deflationary spiral and a negative growth spiral was much uh, was a much higher risk than the risk of high inflation so that's why they did that okay it's uh, so you understand now okay so we have these long discussions so that you can understand all the points around the, the question okay so the other thing that uh, these guys have done is uh, we are still remember we are still answering we are going back to the higher loops we are still answering Tushar's question we are still responding to Tushar's point which is a very important point that uh, the la the flight of capital from active to passive why is this happening one of the things that has driven it is the global financial crisis but how exactly and that's what we are discussing okay in discussing that we were just going into central bank policy making that's when Satyam came with this question so we went into a detail of that okay so now we are going back to this so one of the things going to get, uh, active to passive, it should be going to active to bond market yeah there was there was if you look at uh, if you look at the uh, bond market situation for instance um, if you remove this uh, where is the delete option I don't, I don't think I clicked on it. remove option okay so if you go to um, TNX which is the uh, index for the uh, 10 year treasury yield okay we are still far away. We won't be able to go there. But but yeah, your your what you're what you're saying is correct. That you could have also gone into the bond market, which is uh, basically safe government bonds. Gone into government bonds in a time of crisis. One of the things that happens is that there is a flight of capital into government bonds. Okay, so that is one of the things that interest rate decreases at the time of crisis or increases at the time of. Uh, in what what you tell me what what is going to happen? You tell me. So Should interest rates decrease in a in a time of crisis or increase? Decrease. 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 Down or up? Decrease. Down. down. Okay, because decrease increase, I can't make out the difference. Okay, so it is down actually. Okay, if you look at this ugly little ad which keeps coming, now it will tell me hide for now. Okay, so if you look at this time here, okay, there was a brief uh, period of increase, but more or less, if you are looking at September. 
2008 okay this is september 15th september i think is the lehman bankruptcy so after that you see the us government bond yields have gone down okay so government bonds government bond yields went down which means what happened to government bond prices sure. increase 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 not i'm not getting a thumping response from the whole class well yes kriti if government bond yields went down then what happened to government bond prices one minute let kriti answer increase up or down okay you know i can't hear the difference between increase and decrease okay because it's kind of hard to make out okay so uh, therefore so please remember these basic things okay if somebody asks you in an interview you're a know, finance student and you don't know the relationship between prices and yields okay it's a uh, kind of embarrassing okay so um, so yes in a time of crisis you will see government bond yields because remember bond markets normally when we track bond markets we don't track them when we track stock markets we track them by prices okay if you're tracking stock of apple or microsoft we track the price of the stock in the case of bonds we don't track the price we track the yield okay that is the convention so therefore you'll see that yields will typically fall in a time of crisis okay so you're right that there's typically this is called a flight to safety you might hear this expression yes. this is called a flight to safety when there's a period of crisis people will jump into uh, buying of government bonds okay investing in safe haven currencies like the us dollar japanese yen swiss franc these kind of currencies will involve involve uh, i don't know if the swiss franc can still be seen as a safe haven Why? it huh Why? because the swiss central bank has been following lots of stupid policies actually they have come up with negative interest rates and they're really kind of uh, not not managing the uh, reputation of the swiss franc very well but anyway so uh, this is the situation so but yeah coming back to that so you have a point but remember that those who are equity investors because remember this concept of some of you are going to do financial planning like bopesh riya some of you are in what you're not going to take up that job financial planning in the sense you are going to be planning portfolios for investors what happened riya you're not taking that job okay fine but anyway you got that job as a financial planner financial advisor what these guys do is typically they design portfolios for investors okay so they would be dealing with retail investors and designing their portfolios based on all this life cycle theory that if you are a very young person just starting out you can have more money in equities and less money in bonds but as you approach retirement you should have more money in bonds because bonds offer you a safer return okay uh, it's not a very intelligent approach according to me but this is the conventional approach so you need to know about this okay um yeah so no that i'll tell you later i don't know because first i have to teach you the mainstream ideas okay so later on my unconventional <laughs> ideas that we can do later but first you have to know the mainstream approach the mainstream approach is to say that uh, uh, so so you distribute your assets into equities and bonds okay so uh, therefore um, those who are the reason it doesn't go fully into bonds is because those who are actually uh, let's say young people who want to invest more in equity who need to invest more in equities because equities historically offer higher returns okay so if you go completely into bonds you you may be safer but your returns will uh, diminish okay so it doesn't go fully into bonds it went into passive it went into passive why because now if you go back to the central bank monetary policies okay so what they did was first they went in for zerp or nerp okay but that what ha what happened was even after that there was no uh, impact on growth growth did not pick up okay so therefore what they started to do was quantitative easing okay i'll give you guys a good write up on quantitative easing you can read it i mean a reasonable write up but essentially what is quantitative easing it's just buying bonds to pump money into the economy you are already familiar have you guys done in your banking you you know how monetary policy is conducted yes sir through through repo transactions yes sir open market operations open market operations what is happening in an open market operation what is a central bank buying bonds okay and what is the central bank selling currency currency okay remember every market that's also an instrument repo is an instrument it's a market essentially all right so there is what did we how did we define a market exchange it's a venue for exchanging two assets okay exchanging assets or exchange and usually you'll have two two assets which are exchange okay sugar is exchanged for indian rupees dollars are exchanged for yen okay microsoft stock is common stock is exchanged for us dollars this is how a market operates and you change any of the asset it becomes if you change any of the assets it becomes a different market right yes okay so therefore in the repo market what is happening is what are the two assets 
Let's just test the very basic concept we are testing. In the repo market, now we have defined market in a particular way which you will not find in any particular textbook, but this is the correct definition. Where a market can be defined as a venue for exchanging any two assets, okay? Or exchanging. So, in uh, everyone understands the repo transaction? Yes, sir. Okay. Some, you pretty, you don't, you're not clear what repos. You don't understand repos. Okay. So, everyone understands repos? Akanksha? Understand repos? So now tell me, based on your uh, understanding of markets, you also understand what a market is, the way we have defined a market. Now tell me in a repo transaction, in a repo market, in the repo market, let's say the repo market in, in, in the US, in a repo transaction in the US involving, okay, I won't say what, but in a repo transaction in the US, uh, what are the two assets? The dollar and bonds. Correct. So it'll be US dollar. Any local currency in India, that US dollar will change to Indian rupees. Okay, so it'll be dollar and a bond. Okay, to be more specific, because bonds are only one class, so you should say a debt security. Okay, because it could technically be done through a bill also. All right, so that's not a bond, because a bond is what? What is the difference between a bond and a bill? So bond is for time period. Yeah. So initial maturity is more than one year, and what else? You're not confident about the answer. So the other other difference is what? So there is no coupon in the bill. A bill is a money market. So first, the way you should approach it. You guys are all clueless about your basics of uh, finance. I don't know why people are, everybody looking like, uh, am I sounding like a zombie to you or what? <laughs> Have you not understood the question? Yeah. So these are very basic questions. What's the difference between a bond and a bill? So the way you should answer this mentally in your mind is you should immediately remember that a bond is what is in the bond markets is a bond market instrument because we had divided we had divided debt markets into two parts money markets and bond markets. Okay. In some other books you'll find some other kind of classification that's not correct. Okay. You go with this classification. Okay. And I gave you the reason for that as well why it's not correct. So uh, some people say money markets and capital markets, that's not correct. Okay. So uh, money markets and bond markets and what's the distinction? So the straight away when I ask you the difference between a bond and a bill, you should stay, remember the higher level categories, money markets and bond markets. Mm -hmm. And in the bond markets, uh, what do you have in the bond markets? Yeah. Is more than one year. And? There is a, the word that you should use, there is a discrete coupon. Okay, where there is, uh, and in the case of uh, money markets, initial maturity is less than one year, and there is no coupon rate. The securities are sold at a discount to face value. Okay, this is how you should answer the question. So you should immediately remember when you ask uh, when you get a difference between uh, these two, uh, you know, two categories. You should remember the larger families to which they belong. Bonds belong to the bond market. Bills belong to the money market. And then what is the difference between bond market and money market securities? Same thing will apply. Say now you can apply the distinction like same like Giri asked me a question once. What is the difference between futures and forwards? Okay, so if you have a question like that, straight away you should understand what is forwards are what? OTC or uh, exchange traded? OTC. OTC. Forwards are OTC instruments, futures are ETM. Okay. So therefore, immediately all the distinctions that apply between for OTC and ETC, uh, ETM will apply to forwards and futures. That is one way. So that is the right way to approach the distinction, actually. Logically correct way to approach it in your head. Is this clear? Okay. So quantitative easing now, remember. So therefore, now everyone is clear that in a repo transaction, remembering our basic definition of a market as a venue for exchanging two assets. In a repo transaction, what gets exchanged is one is a debt security and the other is some currency. So in the US, it'll be US dollars. In Japan, it'll be Japanese yen. Okay, local currency essentially. Okay, so uh, therefore, the, this is the exchange. So in a repo transaction, when the central bank is adding funds to the system, when the central bank is adding funds to the system, what uh, what is it buying? It's buying the bonds. Okay, the first leg. In the first leg, it's buying bonds because repo, remember, is repurchase you know the full form right i hope you know the full form of repo 
repo is the US pronunciation here we say repo rate but it's better to say repo because that's a global convention okay so repos comes from repurchase agreements so it's not a it's not a one-sided transaction okay it is typically a case where the government when the government is adding funds in the first leg they will buy the bond okay which means the dealer is selling the bond and then the government in the second leg of the transaction the government will sell back that bond okay at a higher price okay and that higher price is the interest differential that is how you get paid as a i mean for lending the money and it is buying in the first leg what is happening is it's buying the bond and it is selling the cash okay selling the local currency is this clear okay so this is what they were doing in the in a repo transaction so the same thing in quantitative easing what you do is essentially you just buy, uh, buy bonds outright remember this is a repo position is a is like a spread position remember a repo position has how many legs repurchase repurchase is not just a purchase it's a repurchase agreement okay it is i agree to uh, repurchase i'm selling you the bond now the dealer says to the central bank i'm selling you the bond now but i i agree to repurchase that's why it's a repurchase agreement okay so i agree to repurchase the bond after two weeks at a higher price and thereby give you the interest compensation so the central bank will buy the bond at 100 rupees and it will sell the bond at maybe 102 rupees okay after one week or after two weeks that's a high very high interest rate but uh, that's how they'll get compensated on the interest part okay that's how they get paid their interest because the dealer buys back the bond at a higher price okay so now this is a spread position when you have a repo position you have a spread position it's essentially an interest rate position it's a way of financing your uh, you know fund requirement okay so it's a spread position you remember the difference between outright and spread positions yes okay Sahil just woke up and remembered the difference okay okay so outright and spread position or repo is a spread position if you have a position in repo that's a spread position but now imagine this as an outright transaction in quantitative easing what the central bank is doing typically in a classical QE transaction they are just buying bonds outright and so if the central bank is buying bonds what is it selling currency, currency. so in India the RBI is buying bonds if the RBI they didn't do QE in India but in, let's take the US Federal Reserve so with Federal Reserve when it's doing QE what it's doing is outright bond purchases so the Federal Reserve just went into the market and bought bonds so if they bought bonds, what do they sell US dollars. US dollars okay so if the ba central bank is selling US dollars what is happening to the money supply increase. increasing increase. okay so if increasing money supply typically has what kind of impact on the interest rate increase. down or up interest rate down or up, up. up. Down, down, down. what is uh, some are saying down some are saying up so think now, of it this way so yeah and so what is the logic how will Pranav explain that uh, money supply no he said down uh, he said uh, the interest rates will go down if money supply increases so how do you explain that suppose I'm an idiot I don't understand explain it to me one minute let Pranav explain give him the mic in the market there is a uh, more money in the market so there is a more purchasing power by don't, the don't keep saying uh, more money uh, more purchasing more money in the market in the market so there will be a uh, more purchasing power by the customers so uh, the inflation rate will go up so to uh, uh, to get uh, to get down the inflation to normal so the bank uh, bank rates will Increase the interest rate. Will decrease the interest rate. Increase the interest rate. No, but initially you are now contradicting yourself. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. No. So anybody else wants to explain? Yes, Achal. You can redeem yourself after losing four points. Yes. Why should the question is why should interest rates go down if the supply of money increases? Ceteris paribus. Remember that expression? Yes. Okay. So yeah. Because people will have yeah. more money to, uh, uh, to save in the bank and so people are Mike is not being used properly. Hold it closer to your mouth. You have to understand all these things. Yeah. So people will have more money. Uh, so they will deposit more money in the banks and the bank will offer less, uh, less interest rate on the uh, money saved or money deposited by the people. Okay. So this is a much better explanation. Closer to, uh, see simply just think about it this way. Cetris paribus when supply increases what happens to price price goes down okay let's go let's say up or down instead of increase decrease so price is down 
If sub sectors paribus, if supply increases, price goes down. Yes. Yes. Okay. Now, what is the interest rate? Is it not the price of money? Yes. Sir. Interest rate is. Can we see the interest rate as the price of money? Yes. Sir. Okay. So, if the supply of money goes up, then what should happen to the price of money? Yes. Down. So the interest rate goes down. Okay. So Achal has given you a more detailed explanation that essentially if you have excess supply of money okay there are more people willing to lend in a way you can think of it as more people being willing that there's a more supply of uh, loanable funds and so if there's more supply then the price should go down and what is the price of money its interest rates okay all right so let's now have you understood this point yes, so quantitative easing and uh, now first understand because it's a new concept for you and these are very important concepts in finance in this modern age of finance this this qe business has come into the picture only after the gfc okay only after the gfc first the central banks tried to aggressively cut rates down to zero and then some of them went into NERP. okay but that also was not enough to stimulate growth so these guys are panicking what do we need to do to more stimulate growth more so they decided to flood the system with money and how did they do that they did that through qe qe means outright not a repo transaction which is a spread transaction it's an outright purchase of bonds. Just go into the market and sweep up bonds. These Japanese central bank, they've gone completely loco. They have started buying uh, equity securities, ETFs, mutual funds. So essentially the central bank goes in, uh, but typically QE works uh, classically is understood as operating on debt securities, starting initially with government securities, but the ECB has started buying even uh, low grade company debt. Okay. So even my poor grade company, uh, I, mean, uh, I mean, basically not highly ranked debt. So the, the central bank goes in and starts buying bonds in the system. So if the central bank is buying bonds means it's selling currency. So the system is getting flooded with more and more cash. So that will hopefully have an impact on interest rates and bring them further down. Okay. Or at least it will encourage people to be more aggressive in risk taking because that's what they wanted. They wanted to stimulate risk taking and uh, stimulate economic growth. Okay. So this is QE. And they also did a third thing, which is, so as a result of this, okay, before we get into the third, so coming back to Tushar's point, why did this flight from active to, as a result of this kind of aggressive monetary policy movement, okay, what happened was that if you look at these asset prices, okay, if you look at asset prices, like uh, all these, uh, let's say, look at any particular stock, okay, um, Okay, let's just look at it. as a result of this kind of you know you've seen a dramatic rally in it, uh, in equity prices okay so uh, this is say from 2008 this is the 2008 bottom all right this is the 2008 bottom now this dramatic rally in interest uh, in equity prices you can see this in almost any any country in the world okay this has happened partly because of tremendous pumping of money into the system liquidity into the system has been and where will the liquidity go they go and buy risk assets because the central bank is essentially saying that we are standing there as a backstop to give you lots of money we'll pump the system uh, we'll flood the system with money so this encouraged people to go and flood take all the excess money invest in stocks risky securities and right drive up the market but as a result of this what happened was that normally stocks are driven by many types of factors technological change like what is going to happen to tesla battery technology this that adoption of this that technology all kinds of uncertainties drive but what happened because of this kind of aggressive monetary policy movement measures was what happened was that this monetary policy became the number one driver and it of every asset price okay to understand this point it's a little subtle to understand but essentially that monetary policy became so dominant because the system was flooded with so much money that all other factors driving stock returns and asset price returns well basically they got pushed aside so excess uh, supply of money was driving everything so as a result of which active managers found it very difficult to outperform the index because the flooding of money was driving up asset prices everywhere so everything became very correlated okay you understand correlation yes, so when do active managers do well suppose you're smart enough to understand that there's this company called netflix which is going to become a big tiger in the in the streaming space mm -hmm. and you invest in netflix at an early day early stage and you are able to see enjoy the outperformance of netflix compared to others but if everything is going to start so when there's a variation in performance that's when active managers can do well because you're smart enough to pick out the company uh, that is able to outperform but if everything is driven up by excess supply of money monstrous supply levels of money 
then there's no point in being uh, you know actively selecting uh, smartly selecting particular security that everything is going up are you able to follow this okay i think we'll have to conclude now because people are getting restless okay but we want a one minute one minute one minute let's conclude the discussion one minute please don't get restless don't behave like kids okay uh one sec so this is the answer to tushar's question try to understand this point we won't have a chance to do it again so this is why uh the monetary policy response to the gfc is very significantly responsible for driving the change a movement of assets from active to passive is this clear yes. try to understand this point yes. so i i think uh, yeah sushant is definitely understood. <laughs> okay you can go now i owe you Sir, two and a half minutes, minutes. Uh, three minutes. Three minutes. Three minutes. Three minutes. so rounding is